Amen. Please let's be seated. Um, we want to thank God for the opportunity to be here today. Um, and I appreciate Pastor Komoto Shua and his wife. Um, I explained to him this morning that um, it wasn't arrogance why I had not come. And after I explained to him, he said he understood. Amen. So, and um, it's um, emotional, and he understands what I explained to him. But also, I have um, the AGU, Pastor Peter, a personal friend, and of course, the Assistant General of ASEA <clears throat> is here. Um, you know, during the convention, Pastor Motosha preached, and everybody was talking about it. Everybody kept telling me, have you heard what Pastor Motosha preached this afternoon? And um, I said I wasn't there. But each time they asked me, because I was going to preach that evening, all the thing was doing was putting pressure upon me. And so I went back to know what I was going to preach. Aren't you blessed to have such a wonderful man as your pastor? Please, let's rise up and celebrate your pastor. Amen. Amen. And of course, his wife. When you see a man disbalanced, then you must know that the wife has helped him to be balanced. Because women can cause disequilibrium. That means, you know, equilibrium means stable. If you have a wrong wife, you will cause this equilibrium. It's the same thing if you have a wrong husband, it will cause this equilibrium. The trajectory of your life changes. And that's why we always let the young men and the young women know that before you make a choice, don't make choice because of she's beautiful. Because beauty fades. You understand? Don't make choice because uh, the way she cooks. You understand? Anybody can cook. Somebody will always out cook her. Make the choice because you know that this is what God wants you to do. So if anything goes wrong, you can always go back to God and say, you told me this is my wife. Amen? But I'm not here to talk about that today, man. I'm here to preach. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to talk about you. What a privilege. My Father, my God, as we share this word, let it bring life. Let it bring understanding. Let the people not say they've had a good sermon, but let them be able to say that the Lord has spoken to them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And you know, Pastor Peter is one of my favorite pastors and favorite preachers. Of course, you know, a lot of his sermon, there was a time I told him, please, all your sermons, give them to me. Let me, let me start to re-preach them. Amen. Let's celebrate Pastor Peter and make him up. I want to share with us about faith today, the force of faith. Habakkuk chapter 2 says that the just shall live by faith. Romans 1 17 says the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3 11 says the just shall live by faith. And if they said that and repeated it, that the just shall live by faith, maybe the first thing that we need to ask ourselves, who are the just? Who are the just? The just are the righteous people. The just are the people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and their Savior. Those are the just people. Those are the people who have been justified by God, washed by his blood. So the Bible says that for every believer, born again believer, we have no other choice than to live by faith. So if we live by any other means, we are supposed to be, we are, that means we are on our own. Because God expects you and me to live by faith. He says the just has no other option than to live by faith. In that fact, where you don't live by faith, life will be challenging to you. 
And the reason is very simple. God is spirit. We, no, no, nobody has ever seen God. But we have made God by his word. And since we cannot see him, the only way God communicates to us is through his word. And how does faith affect that one? Because then you have no other choice if you want to believe in God than to believe in his word and have faith in what he has said that he will do. So faith is so critical for us in communicating with God. Where we do not know the mind of God, where we look at the word that we have, we believe in that word, have faith in what he has said, and then we say, thus says the Lord, that's what I'm going to do. Faith simply also means obedience. Faith simply means obedience. Obedience, that is, this is what it says. I will obey it. And when you find out the father of faith, Abraham, one of the first things the Bible says that when God called him, he obeyed. He obeyed without any controversy. He obeyed God. Because you will never live a life of faith without obedience. Take out obedience. Fail falls flat on his face. He falls flat on his face. So you must live a life of obedience to have faith. So if that is the case, this cannot be my seconds because I started, uh, I have more than these seconds. Anyway, <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse 1. So that means we have to go and ask ourselves, what then is faith? When the Bible says the just shall live by faith. So we need to ask ourselves, what then is faith? Let's look at what the Bible says faith is. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for. That's even like an oxymoron. Because how can it be what you hope for and it's a substance? Because once it's a substance, it means you can touch it, you can feel it, you can see it, and the Bible says that you are still open for it. How can you be open for a substance? Then the next thing he said is the, is the evidence of things not seen. How can it be evidence if it had not been seen? Because in the court of law, they will say, where is the evidence? He says, this is the evidence. Which is what uh, uh, Potiphar's wife did. Showed um, um, yeah, Joseph's garment. He says, this is the evidence. But here, the Bible says, is the evidence of things not seen. So, it is a reality. I'm going to read the New Living Translation for us. Faith is a substance that what we hope for will actually happen. That is what we hope for will actually happen. I like the way it says it. Says it gives us assurance about things we cannot see. That means the word of God. Whatever God says, this is what it will be. We might not be able to see it. We might not be able to feel it. It might not be to the five normal senses. Smell, taste, and all of those things. But if you say that this is what God has said, I believe in it. I hold family to it. I'm going somewhere today. You have no idea where I'm going. Just follow me. Hey, verse 3. Uh, he says that by faith we understand. Hebrews 11, 3. We understand that the words were framed by the word of God. That the words that we're living, that the things that we see, the vegetation, the sky, the firmament, and all that we see, the Bible says here that they were framed by God's word. So it tells us that his word is so important and has the potency to do what God has sent it out to be. And that's why they say the word, God's word will never return to him void until he has accomplished that which he has been sent out to. And so we found out that this word, the things that we see, they came out of what was not existing. <laughs> oh my God. So what does that mean to you and me? It means that if you go to the hospital, and they tell you, you do not have a womb. It is not for you to panic. It's for you to look for the right word of God that says that there will not be any barren in the land. To say, no, I'm not going to be barren. And so because of that, I know womb is not existing. But the Bible says that through faith, we understand that the words were framed by the word of God. And so that the things which are seen, were not 
made from things that do appear. So it might not have appeared now. The word of God can bring it out from where it was not before for you to become what you want it to be. So it doesn't matter. They said there is no vacancy. There is no opportunity here. So you know that, yes, the opportunity might not be there before. But the word of God can create opportunity. Can create what is not existing before. Can come to start to exist. That's faith. That's what the Bible says. That's what faith is. So it's not there. Don't panic. <laughs> it's just for you to speak the word of God. That is, it can produce. And that's what the word of God does. Is that if, the Bible, if, if God says, this speaker is white. And we all know that it's black. But when the word of God makes this speaker that is black. It changes to what the word has said, white. So it doesn't matter what's going on. We can't panic. All we need to do is to know his word. And that's why it says the word was framed by the word of God. The same word that framed the heart when it was not without form or shape. The same word is the same word we have today. The potency of the word of God does not leak. You know what that means? So it does not say it's not as effective as it used to be. That's why the Bible says forever, oh Lord, your word is settled. From age to age, from time to time, from season to season, nothing changes the word of God. The potency he had at the beginning is still the same potency he has now. So, the less the potency is the less your faith. It is not the word of God that is no more potent. The effectiveness of it is always the same. So, if not effective, it's because of your faith. I'm going somewhere today. Follow me. Then we look at verse 4. We are doing Bible study this morning. I'm not here to preach. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Though which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Let's look at this text. We find out that number one, Abel was not the first man on the earth. He was the fourth but the Bible picked him as the first person they mentioned about faith and how faith works. And the one thing they said about him was that he had a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. That means two of them made sacrifice. But one was more excellent than the other. And so here the Bible tells us that he made an excellent and I really don't want to come deep into this. But let's, let's see how we can go with this. So I found out that the first step of faith is sacrifice. The first step of faith is sacrifice. And what does sacrifice mean? You know, sacrifice means the ability to give up what is precious. To give it for a greater good. To give up something for a greater good. So for everybody... If the elementary, the rudimentary, the basic, and what faith is built upon is first a life of sacrifice. And it's so simple. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, the just shall live by faith. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, the first thing we must do is that there must be certain things we must give up. And they said it so well in this same Hebrews about Moses. They say, when Moses came of age, he forsook some things. <laughs> Because you've got to what? Forsake some things. There must be, you know, and the way we will say it is that since you became saved, what has changed? Some things must change unless the world has not come inside of you. There must be some things that you start to feel uncomfortable about that you were doing before. So the foundation of it is that you need to always ask yourself, what have I sacrificed for a greater good? What have I given up for a greater good? And that's what the first thing you must do. And you use the word excellent. The word excellent means it's not to say, hey, all right, I've given up just this one. No, 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 no. You look at your life and you say, whatever God says I shouldn't have, I won't have it. Though I like to have it, but because it must be an excellent one. Because you could do like, like this, uh, 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 
oh, what's this guy who, 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 who gave a, a, a sacrifice that was not acceptable to God? So, you know, you, there are times when you can do, give an, a sacrifice, but God knows you can do much more than that. Because the man gave also. He wasn't the only one that gave. But God received one. And what did God say? He says, wait a minute. You know what to do. If you have done the right thing, you will have been accepted. And so we find out that the first thing is sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. And it's for you to look at whatever you do and ask, wait a minute, since I became saved, what have I given up? What have I sacrificed for a greater good that I know the Lord Jesus Christ? For my salvation. All right, we'll look at the next one. I can't go deep. I have, don't have time. I have a whole lot in my heart. Then the next person they said about is number, two, number five. By, no, no. All right, let me say this one. And true eat, being dead, still speaks. That means that faith <laughs> can outlive you a life of faith. Your testimony can continue even after you are dead. But let's not look at it literally like that. That is, what you do, the sacrifices you give, can become a memorial, can become so significant that even though you are not around, it's still working. It's still doing great things. It's still affecting your children's children. It's affecting generations by the life of sacrifice. Let me say this. Two things, three things, you must always check for your sacrifice. Your time. You must sacrifice your time for God. You must. Your talent, the gifting that God has given to you, must always sacrifice. That's, let me just put, quickly say this one. I don't you know, this is a very nice cream. You are in IT. And God's giving you talent. That is brain. And you go every day. You come here, you enjoy all of this. You've never come to tell them. I can improve this. I can add value to this. I can do much. You can do much more. There are, you will walk away every Sunday. Because why? The talent God has given to you. You are selfish about it. You think it's only for yourself. Let me tell you this. Anything God gives to people, the first reason why he gives it is for his kingdom. Trust me. You know, and it's for his, when it's, let me even uh, 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 drill it down. It's for his church. Yes. Why do I say that? God gave his only begotten son so that the church can be born. So I, I don't need to meet God <laughs> to know what is most important to him. I know what's most important to God. The church, the ecclesias, you and me. Yes. Not only the building, the called out people. We are the most important people to God. Why? Because he gave his only begotten son so that the church can be born. So if he did that, nobody needs to tell me that I am so important to God. If he died for me, I am very important to him. And so we must understand that that is one thing that our talent we must be used for. We must ask ourselves, in what area can I use my talent? So you must use your time. As a choir come every day in the week to do, to, uh, to, uh, to practice, a lot of people don't want to be workers. Guess why they don't want to be workers? Because of their time. They don't have time. But you know what? Don't forget this. People have time for what they want to have time for. You know, people say this, oh, it's because I don't have time. They say it's because I don't have time. I don't have time. But you know what? It, it, the people who amaze me the most are the single ladies. They say they don't have time. Listen. You don't have time? <laughs> then you get married. Then you start to have children. You have the first one. You have the second one. You are pregnant with the third one. Then you are going to work. Then you are still, you start want to do a course. And then um, you take care of your, of your husband. And then you have your grandmother, your mother is around. And uh, somebody is around. Where did all that time come from? All of a sudden, it was more than 24 hours. No, 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 no. You just decide to know, to allocate your time the way you want to allocate it. Because where did you get the time? To take care of your husband, take care of two children, you are still pregnant, you are still going to work, you are doing a career change, you are doing all of those things. Where did that time come from? You find time for what you want. Then the third thing that you must always have is what we call your tithes. 
your talent, your time, and your tithe. The tithe is not only 10%. I don't want to get into that. But that is your money. You must sacrifice your money. That's the way. You know, never forget this. In God's kingdom, it is not buying and selling that makes us. It is sowing and reaping. That's how we make money in God's kingdom. And that's the thing the church has continuously missed. It is God's grace that comes upon your sowing and then you reap. So as believers, we sow. That's what God has said to us. And if you look at the story of the Israelites, God asked them to continuously give. They have given that they call wave. Even wave is an offering. Everything was... Con look, go and look at the story of the Israelites. The level of... I think they have nearly 10 different kinds of offerings that God expects from them. And they are the prototype of those of us who are the divine Israel today. And we, when we talk about giving, they say they're always talking about giving. Let me tell you, there are a lot of people are anti-Christ. A lot of people are, um, sorry, you know what I mean by that. They are miserly. And because of their miserliness, they try to let everybody come under that kind of cloud. Yes. You understand? So they say they talk to give. If you don't want to give, don't give. But don't prevent those who want to give. Yes, Why are you doing that? That's their way to their blessing. That's the way to their blessing. Oh, God. I didn't want, I wanted to leave this verse. Let me try and leave it now. I'm telling you, there's still a whole lot there. It's your, it's your, it's your giving speaking when you're not even there. Can they point to something that they can say, you gave this? Like they did about Dockers. The Bible says that they showed the things that Dockers did while he was alive with them in the book of Acts of the Apostles. Can people point to your own garments? Can people point to the things that you have done, that you have bought, and all of those things? I am not boasting here. We have this big screen in our church, bigger than nearly this whole wall. High Gandhi pay for nearly three quarters of it. And though I'm the pastor. So whether I'm there or not, they said the pastor paid for this. What are you talking about? He's speaking. Whether you are there or not. And it's not being boastful. It's a testimony. And let me tell you, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to impress upon your heart what you need to do. But let's go on. Verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken away. So, let's read that together. I love this, my God. Let's read it together. By faith. Hold on. <laughs> amazing. That verse is amazing. I can do it. A whole series on that verse. Listen to this. The Bible says by faith Enoch was translated <laughs> that he should not see death. Every born, everyone born of a woman must die. Every woman being dies. But by faith, God made an exception of him. Ha! That means that everybody can say, this is the run of play. This is what happens to every immigrant. This is what happens to every man. This is what happens to every sister that is over 35 or 40. They can say that one. But faith, that is holding on to the word of God. You can say it happens like that for them, but it doesn't mean it will happen like that for me. The Bible says it was translated that it did not see what everybody saw by faith. But they, let me tell you this. But you can ask me, how did that happen? The answer is there. And it was not because God had taken him. For before he had, he was taken, he had this testimony. <laughs> so when your life pleases God, <laughs> you don't have to go through what everybody goes through. <laughs> how does a life please God? Amos tells us, can two work together? Unless they agree. And so, faith makes us to always agree with God. Not only when it's convenient or when it's not convenient. Faith makes us to always agree. And so, his life became pleasing. So, when they say, this is what happens to everybody, it, didn't, it doesn't have to happen to you. Because you know what? My life pleases God. I'm always agreeing with God. I know it's not easy, but it's what you are saying. Forever, oh Lord, your word is said to So what you say is what I'm going to do. Listen to me. God has called you and me to walk with him. So that what happens to everybody, we do not have unto us. So, because there is a testimony 
that people would always hear that when I came into this country, I had to do this. I had to work here. I had to do this kind of thing. But no, 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 no. Your own case doesn't have to be like that. You have to believe God. That God, this is what you have said. I am the head and not the tail. I am not going to do any tail job. And that's not arrogance. Lord, I'm standing upon your word. It's for you to always get God's word. Agree with that God's word. So that what happens to everybody does not happen to happen to you. Don't take that from people. Don't shortchange yourself. They will say he was translated. You know how it is. You are stand, 50 of you are standing on the line. And you are trying to get into the bank. And the bank says, we have closed. And all of a sudden, somebody comes. He says, you, come. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs> Please open the door for him. Let him do. Hey, people say, you know. He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's just him alone. That's the kind of thing I'm saying. He catches everybody. He won't catch you. Yes. Against the run of play. That's what, but the Bible gave us the answer. It says, because he pleased God. Then there is this one that we always read. We read it separately, but it's not separate. It is an appendage to verse 5. But without faith. <laughs> they say that his life pleased God. So the Bible now told us how we can please him. Continue to read it. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. He now gave us, this is where this verse should start from. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, the way it should have been is that those that diligently seek him and believe in him will always, and who knows that God is a rewarder, everything will always be good for them. Let me say this one. You know, when you say diligently, diligently means you don't pick and choose <laughs> which one you are going to follow. When you are diligent, consistent. When you are diligent, reliable, dependable. That's it. And you are dependable on you saying the leader that coming to God must believe the matter must be settled. That there is nothing that is impossible for God. Many times we still doubt, will he do it, will he not do it? No. You know, the Bible talks about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the Bible tells us that he got to a stage in his life. That he doubted, he said, are you the one or should we look for another? How can a man who spent his whole life talking about Jesus, he's the one who says, behold the lamp of God that taketh away the lamp, the, he, 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 what he did, he gave an affirmation to the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it got to a stage that he doubted everything. Let me tell you this. Faith that has not been tested is no faith. How are you going to know? It's the test that tells us. The test that came upon John with everything, he shook him. In natural fact, Jesus Christ said he's a reed shaken by the wind. A reed shaking here and there. Unstable. And that's why the Bible says that Abraham did not stagger in faith. When you say he did not stagger, it tells us that situation, you know when you say he did not stagger, that means the situation as could make him stagger, but he did not. It will, when we face certain situations, like the testimony the lady was sharing this morning, you, there are times when the report they give to you sucks the life out of you. There are times when they tell you certain things you, you want to give up. But the ability for you to receive that report and for you to keep standing and says, forever, O oh Lord, I know your word is settled concerning my life. You are saying my horn is as strong as the horn of the unicorn. This report, I am not going to be moved. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So, you receive the report, but yet you say one thing. Ah, uh -uh. I'm not going to stagger. I'm not going to waver. I'm going to consistently be there. God even had to test his son, Jesus. 
before you could use it. You go through test, but will your faith hold up? Will you believe in him? Those who diligently, consistently seek him, not looking for him because God is not lost, but just consistently and diligently standing firm. Look at the next verse. Let's move on because of time. By faith, we are being warned of God of things not seen as yet. <laughs> you know, the, the Bible is a very interesting book. I like the Bible. They said, it was one of things that has not been seen yet. How can you be warned of things that have not been seen yet? How do you even concept, conceptualize what it can be like when it has never been seen? And so, the Bible is telling us of an extreme situation of God saying, this is what I'm going to do. Like the testimony the pastor gave. It has not been seen yet that anyone has been cured of this kind of thing. <laughs> has not been seen yet. How do you even conceptualize that? But what we read before is that we must believe that we got nothing. It's impossible. Nothing with it is impossible. Move with fear, and the fear that is not afraid. It means respect and honor for him. God does not want his children to be afraid of him. He wants us to give him respect and honor. What he says, come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy. Boldly, not with fear and trepidation. Come boldly. Come as your children. Because I'm your father. So don't come with fear. God is not an African father. It's African father that wants their children to be scared of them. No, he says, I'm a good father. I'm the one who started fatherhood. I know what fatherhood will come boldly. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world. You know, there's so much in this. Like, like I said, you know, maybe let me, let, let, let me just mention this one and then I quickly move on. He said, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. And this is for the men. You know, you must understand that as men, we must be priests over our homes. You know, you must be priests over our homes. Don't let our wives be the priests of our homes. We should take charge. Now is a good example that he made sure that his family was saved. Many of us who have teenagers now, we allow them to do whatever they want to do. And then we wonder when they're in their 20s, they turn into what we don't like. No, children must be guided. Children must be guided. Because the heart of the child is full of different things that are evil. Because it's in sin we are born, it's in sin we are formed. So we will likely have the affinity towards sinful nature. So we must guide them. That's what makes us the father. So it's important that if not for anything, while I was growing up, I didn't live with my dad. I lived with my mom. But the, going to church was not an option. We, uh, where will I, what will I say? That until I was 27 years old, when I left, I started living on my own. My, parent, my mom, going to church was never an option. I would go to party the night before, but what betide me if I don't go, get up in the morning to take her to church? It wasn't an option. I remember I was 27. I was drinking. And I passed my mom. Because when I'm going to her place, at that time I wasn't staying with her. When I'm going to her place, I, will, I used to drink. So I would have taken a whole lot of things to freshen my mouth. My mom passed me. Did you drink? Oh, I said, no, how can I be drinking? I was 27 years old. Because I know exactly what she's going to do next. It will give me a roundabout slap. <laughs> that I'll be wondering whether I'm alive or dead. He said, ah, what did I smell? I said, no, it's the, it's the mint or something. that." Happened. Men, your children, your word should mean something to your children. I'm telling you. But we're, not, we're talking about faith. By which he condemned the world and became here of righteousness by faith. Let me just point out something here. The same flood, the same flood that drowned the people, that killed them, was the same flood that raised 
<laughs> no, to safety. Faith. It doesn't mean it happens to people in a particular way. When you follow God, the same thing people are drowning inside is the same thing that raised Noah and his family to safety. Let's go back and believe in God. Let's go back and believe in God. Listen, these three individuals, the three people they first mentioned, they were not the first three people who were in the world. But I believe they were mentioned in the Hall of Fame, Hall of, Fame of Faith for us to learn something. That, number one, the foundation of faith is sacrifice. And then the next person, he walked with God. W-A-L-K. That means it tells us that after you, you, you accept the life of sacrifice, you have to now walk with him. Then, number three, Noah walk for God. W-O-R-K. He tells me that for our faith to be built in the Lord, our life must first be a life of sacrifice. Then we have to continuously walk with him. at the next verse. Let's look at verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called that he should go into a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. Can you see what faith is? Because the work of faith, if you figure it out, you don't need God. You don't need him if you have figured it out. No. You, 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 you have a faith work is saying Lord, you have said it. It doesn't look the best, but once you've said it, that's what I would do. That's it. He didn't know where he was going. He's the father of faith. So woke up one morning, said to the wife, we are going. Where are we going? I don't know. Ah, you don't know? Yes, I don't know. But who told you? God. Where did you meet him? He told me. <laughs> that's what he did. He looked stupid. But let me tell you this, if you really live a life of faith, you will look stupid most of the time. That's the truth. If you live a life of faith, a whole lot of times, people will not be able to understand you. Because God's ways are not our ways. God doesn't process things the way we process things. God, the Bible says, is the Alpha and the Omega. The one who sees the end before the beginning starts. So he puts it in place. That's why he wants us to he wants us to commit all our ways. All, not some of our ways. All our ways. Why? Because he is the one who is the compass and the navigation of our lives. Man, wisdom, very great. But man's wisdom is limited in all his ways. Man's is myopic and man is parochial. Parochial and myopic. But God sees 360. Totality of things. So God takes decision based upon the totality of the matter. Not because of the narrowness of our minds. And so his ways we find it difficult to understand. Like, like, like in, in Exodus chapter 13. When the Bible says that when the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt... He took them through a longer route. Why did he do that? He did that because he's, the Bible says, I think it's verse 11, Exodus 13, because he says that because he knew who they are. He knew them. He knew that they did not have the ability to fight. And so he took them. So you will have said, but why is God taking me through this long route? But God knows you. He knows who you are. He knows what you can do. So it's better because you do not know where you, what you can do. It's better for you to follow him. How do you follow God? You follow his word. That's what you do. 
you follow his inner witness. That's why we have the Holy Spirit that guides us, that tells us what to do. Jesus Christ said it so well. He says, he will guide you into all truths. <laughs> Not only that, the one that excites me the most is that it will tell you of things to come. Abba, how come then we believers miss this thing? He says he will tell us the advantage we have is the ability that we have the Holy Spirit who will tell us of things to come. So he can show us years to come. So you want to do a course, he says, no, don't do this course. In, by the time you graduate, they, they, you will not get a job. Because the ability of him being the Omega who sees the end. He guides us. Jesus said, don't worry, he will guide you into all truth. Show you things to come. So we should never miss it if we follow God. That's it. We should never miss it if we follow God because he's all knowing. He knows everything. He knows your life. God knows 10 years time. He knows 10 years time. You do not know what's going to happen five minutes. He knows 10 years time. So when he says, no, do this. I know. This is what everybody's doing. Say, don't, don't worry. All of them in 10 years, they'll be looking for a job. You do this. You'll be forced. You'll be forced. They'll be using you. When they, you know how they say, do you know that course that brother uh, Felix is doing? You know how the people say that? They'll be using you as an example. When they say people have Midas touch, forget Midas touch for us as believers. We are not with Midas touch. What we are with is the leading of the Spirit of God. We are led. The children of God are led. That's how we are. We are led. But let's look at this. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise. I like this verse. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. This, this verse. I like it. I like it. I like it. Look at what it said. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. <laughs> As in a strange country. Have you not felt like that living in New York? That this is where God has told you to be. But you still feel like a stranger. You still cannot understand the city. You can't still understand how your life is. That's what happened to him. The Bible says, dwelling in tabernacles. I like another one that says tent. Tent. I think they, they, they live there by faith like a foreigner living in tents. Let me try and round up. God called him out of a permanent situation where he was living and promised him a permanent situation. Called him out of a permanent situation and promised him a permanent situation. But now, a man that left a permanent situation ends up living in tents which is a temporary situation. Yes. How can a man live a permanent situation on God's word, believing that God has spoken to them and end up in a temporary situation, believing him for a permanent situation? Let's see to what the Bible says. No, 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 go back to in the New King James. And so, by faith, so, and he is with him of the same promise. It didn't literally happen like that. There was no time the three of them were living together. But they were saying this in a symbolic way. Because the Bible talks, tells us that he had, that um, Jacob or Isaac paid, paid um, tithes while he was still in the house. Huh? Yeah. Or Levites. So what it just means that, of course, they were still in his lines. Listen to me. Look at the next verse. Let me tie this together as I try and close. For he looked for a city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. There's a lot in there. Number one, he tells us that <laughs> not every city has foundations. 
It also tells us that not every city is God the builder and the maker of. Are you following me? Yes. Please follow me. I'm taking a turn. I'm taking a turn. Please follow me. God promised this man. He was living in a tense situation. In the Mediterranean. Where it is hot during the day. And cold at night. When you have winds that comes. It's a sandy place. They were living in desert situation in that place. So I can imagine that the wind comes, blows away the tent, and I can imagine or conjecture in my mind how Abraham picks up the tent and goes back and restores the tent. Don't forget he came out of a permanent situation, going to a permanent situation. Now he's living in a temporary hold with all the attending difficulties and the challenges that comes with it. But what makes a man to still continue to be the father of faith and still have faith in God, though he's witnessing so much pressure in a tense situation? Oh my God. But guess what? Even though he was going through this pressure, the Bible says he still looked for a city that has foundation. You, you get this one on Wednesday. You know why? L listen to this. Because when you are under pressure, whatever comes your way, you hold on to it. But though he was under pressure, he did not let the pressure be cloud his life or be cloud his thinking. <laughs> he was still checking out. You don't check out when you're under pressure. Whatever comes, you say, hallelujah, thank God, you embrace it. But no, he didn't do that. He was still looking. Is God the maker <laughs> and the builder of this city? When he cannot locate God, he kept moving. Do you know what this man did? It's what saved him and his generation. Because Lot, who was with him, did not care when he moved to Sodom and Gomorrah whether it was a city that has foundation or whether God was the builder and the maker of it and he lost everything many of us this is what happens to us we are desperate we are under pressure we say we can't handle this tense situation but let me tell you this in the work of faith as you walk with God you will always be in a tense situation where you don't know how long it's going to be <laughs> oh my God Jesus Christ went Oh, I didn't want to preach it today, but I feel like preaching. You know, Jesus Christ went into the, into the synagogue. And after he finished preaching at 8.12, the Bible says that the people who were there, extremely knowledgeable people, the professors, they were amazed at his teaching at age 12. Oh, my God. For the next 18 years, he was in a tense situation. How does a person... Speak at 8, 12, with all the ovations, people giving him credit, um, a business card. When will you come and preach for us and everything? And then it goes back <laughs> into the camp preaching workshop of Joseph. And knowing that he's the savior of the world, for 18 years, waiting for the prompting of the Lord before he will move. Let me tell you this, the work of faith there will be time when you will be in a tense situation. What do you do when you're in a tense situation? What do you do when you're under pressure? What do you do when things does not seem clear? The Bible says, I look for, but let me cut this a little bit deeper. I don't know who I've come to talk to here. Maybe you are 40. Yeah, old woman, you're desperate. The guy you're saying today, can you really say that God is the maker and the builder of that person's life? Can you really say the person has foundations? What are the, when we say foundation, what are the person's core beliefs? Are the person's core beliefs the same as your beliefs? Are these beliefs based upon the word of God? 
or upon the wisdom of men. Can you really say the relationship you are in, it has foundations? Can you really say the man or the woman you are attaching yourself to, can you really say that God is the builder and the maker of them? And how do you know that? The choices of their lives. He said, we don't, we don't know. He says, no, 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 no. Don't say you don't know. Buy their fruits. You will know them. Because, they, you know, you may not know how a mango tree is. But when you see mango on it, nobody needs to tell you this apple tree or this is an orange tree. No, you will say this is a mango tree. You will know. The choices of their life will let you know. The places where they go will let you know. The way they handle things will let you know. The, what they have affinity towards will let you know what they are, whether God is the maker and the builder of them. You will know unless you want to deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Look at what happened to Lot. He lost everything. His next generation was a complete mess because of his choices. The Bible says he looked at the well watered. The thing was green. He was going to be good for his capsule. Don't choose because of physical things. Physical things changes. Yes. They change. They change. So you must ask yourself this question. Is God the maker? Is God the builder? If I can't locate God, I'm moving on. This business I'm doing, is God the builder? Is God the maker? Or oh, I'm in this business out of envy and jealousy for somebody. <laughs> Never yield to pressure that the enemy brings upon us. He did it to Jesus Christ. He knew he was hungry. He, the first thing he told him is, eat. That's it. But one thing you must never forget is that all Satan apples have worms. It's when you bite it that you will realize that it has worms. No matter what he offers you. Because sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. I'm telling you. Because you start to lie. You start to change things. You start to... Different things. Fear comes. It will take you farther than you want to go. Let's look at the next one. Let me try no, go on. Go on. Go on, go on. All right. Let me, let, me, let me give us a key. They all died in faith. Not having received the promise. This tells us a lot of things. That faith, time and season doesn't change it. Even if at the point of death, you will still hold on to what God has said. So he says, oh, they all died in faith. Not having received them, but having seen them afar off. Three principles that the Bible shares here with us. Number one, he says they were persuaded. That's number one. Don't forget. And the next thing is they embraced. Number two. Number three, they confessed. Let me take this in one, one minute or two. You will never embrace when you are not persuaded. Persuasion is strong conviction. It's a feeling that I have crossed the Rubicon. Nothing is changing my mind. So, you've got to get to the position where you are what? Where you are persuaded, convinced that this is what the Lord has said. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to hold on. And so, after you are persuaded, you embrace, not hold on to, embrace. When you embrace something, you embrace it with your totality of your body. That is, you embrace it with your whole being. If you are not persuaded, you will not embrace it. Even if you hold on to it, you will drop it like a broken toy when the challenges of life comes. And then he confessed. What do you do? What do you mean by that? You continue to confess 
the word of God. Lord, I believe in you. You are the one who says, you will never lead me nor forsake me. The one that watches over Israel, neither sleep nor slumber. So, Lord, I believe your word. Have you said it? You will do it. That you are not a man that you will lie. So, I know. Have you said it? You will do it. You will continue to confess his word. He's the one who says, remind me of my promises. Continue. So that's what you do. You hold on to it in the face of everything. But you will never hold on until you are persuaded about the word of God. Oh God. Let me show you something. Verse 15. I still have a whole lot, but let's... let's, let's um, Verse 14 says, for those who say such things, declare plainly that they seek a homeland. So, what is that saying? It's saying to that those people who say this kind of thing, the world that we live in is not their greatest concern. They see past the world we live in. They see past the present life. Because what is 70 years compared to eternity? They rather seek a life with the Lord, like they said about Moses in this place, than the pleasures of Egypt for a season. Verse, verse 15. Everybody say, and truly. And truly. Please say, and truly once again. Please say, and truly. You know, this verse is one of the reasons why I like the Bible. I'm telling you the truth. This verse. Look, look at what this verse says. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from where they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. When you are in a tense situation, when you are under pressure, a dog must never go back to his vomit. There is a tendency that since we can't go forward, as I say in where I come from, at least we can go backward. The Bible agrees that the pressures of life, the challenges they face, where they stepped out walking by faith, and truly, <laughs> I want you to know today that everybody who is a believer, the just shall live by faith, you must come to and truly junction. If you have not yet gotten to a truly juncture in your work of life and your work with God, you have not started or you are still going to get there. It's not a junction that you can avoid. In a lot of the decisions that you will get to, and truly will always show up to say, and truly, <laughs> if I consider what I have been through, I will have gone back. But the good thing is that they never went back. They continued in the face of the pressures of life. This is what faith in God is. Faith in God is not, I test it. If it doesn't work, I'm going back. No, 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 no. Faith in God is, I'm testing it. Whether it works or not, I'm there. I'm here for the long haul. I'm not here for the short haul. I'm here for the long haul, not short haul. I'm here all the time. I've passed the Rubicon. No one can change my mind concerning what I have believed. Mm -mm, nobody can. That's why it's surprising that a lot of people, even in their giving, social media is changing your mind. What a disgrace to the body of Christ. Somebody sits down in his, in, his, in his sitting room and writes something and you are believing in the thing. The fundamentals of our faith, the foundations of our faith, people are challenging it. It means that you are not persuaded. When you are persuaded, social media is not going to dictate what you are going to do. You tell them, no, I am persuaded. This one, I am embracing it. <laughs> this one, I am going to continue to confess that you are the one who says you give bread to the, so to the eater and seed to the sower. You are the one who says you will open the windows of heaven unto me. Lord, I'm expecting. You are the one who anoints my head and my cup over, will run it over. I'm expecting overflow in my life. You continue to confess. You hold on to the foundations of our faith. No one, even if pastor is saying something, say, after the service, pastor, that thing you said, 
<laughs> me, I, I've gone with Jesus too far. I, I just say, I'm not going to go back home. That one, you're on your own. Because you, you understand what you believe. The foundations. That's what he was looking for. Because he knows that if you choose anything by what you see on top, when the wind comes, <laughs> oh my God, great will be the fall. Great will be the fall. You can choose like that. He's the foundation that decides. He decides everything. And that's why the Bible says, you know, that's why I said like, but the Bible agrees that and truly. Ah, if you have to face fact, if you have to assess the situation, they, there will always be an opportunity to go back. But you have to make up your mind that we are not with those that go back. We are with those who are going forward. I have put my hand on the plow. I'm not looking back. <laughs> I've gone too far. At this stage, no. Abba is too far. I've gone too far to go back. I'm out of time. I'm not out of message. Let's bow down our heads. Let's bow down our heads. I want us to bow down our heads. Let's, let's talk to the Lord. Let's, let's talk to the Lord. Let's talk to the Lord. Let's talk to the Lord. Ask God to strengthen your faith in his word. The, the only way your faith is going to be strengthened is by you paying close attention to his word. Because that's the anchor that holds fast. That's what holds fast. His word. You, let's go back to believe God's word. Let's go back to trust him. Let's go back to know that with God nothing will be impossible. Let's go back. Let's go back to doing that. Don't forget the three things. Your time. Your talent and your tithes. It's time for tithes and offering. Don't hold back. I tell people I tight myself out of my tight situation. I know I can never be poor again. Because I found what it is how not to be poor. That's it. So you and repeat. That's it. That's how we operate in this kingdom. Not running around with buying and selling. There's nothing wrong with buying and selling. But it's the grace of God that gives increase. That's what gives increase. Father Lord, we thank you for your word. Let it not fall to the ground, Lord. The ones that are mine, let them forget. The ones that are yours, let them remember. Thank you, Lord. For all you do and for all you